Well, good morning and welcome to Matins on this Wednesday of the week after Pentecost. Thank you for being with me today. Uh, the scriptures we're going to use today are Psalm 89, just the first 18 verses. We'll move into Ezekiel chapter 34, and we're going to continue in 1 John chapter 2. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Blessed Lord, you speak to us through the Holy Scriptures. Grant that we may hear, read, respect, learn, and make them our own in such a way that the enduring benefit and comfort of the Word will help us grasp and hold the blessed hope of everlasting life given us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. Okay. Our psalm is number 89. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. From age to age, my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persuaded that your love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. The heavens bear witness to your wonders, O Lord, and to your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the gods? God is much to be feared in the council of the holy ones, great and terrible to those round about him. Who is like you, Lord God of hosts? O mighty Lord, your faithfulness is all around you. You rule the raging of the sea and still the surging of its waves. You have crushed Rahab of the deep with a deadly wound. You have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. Yours are the heavens. The earth also is yours. You laid the foundation of the world and all that is in it. You have made the north and the south. Tabor and Hermon rejoice in your name. You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand and high as your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. Love and truth go before your face. Happy are the people who know the festal shout. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your presence. They rejoice daily in your name. They are jubilant in your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. And by your favor, our might is exalted. Truly the Lord is our ruler. The Holy One of Israel is our King. Let us pray. Mighty God, in fulfillment of the promise made to David's descendants, you established a lasting covenant through your firstborn son. You anointed your servant Jesus with holy oil and raised him higher than all kings on earth. Remember your covenant, so that we who are signed with the blood of your son may sing of your mercies forever. Through your son Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Okay. So our first reading... is from Ezekiel chapter 34. 
We're going to read verses 1 through 16. The word of the Lord came to me, says the prophet. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth, with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey, and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd, and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths. They may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep, and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. And the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. So yesterday we heard that although Ezekiel had been muted um, a couple of different times, actually, he was unmuted when, A, when the word of the Lord came to him. And B, when the word of the Lord came true, which is what happened in yesterday's reading. Jerusalem fell, so Ezekiel's muteness has been undone, which was all according to plan. So, he, the last chapter talked about restoration, right? But Israel, I'm sorry, Jerusalem has fallen. And um, so Ezekiel had to address those who were wicked and tried to escape. And what's going to happen to them? They're not going to they're not going to escape God's wrath. Those who were faithful, told to remain and wait to be captured, were captured. And then Ezekiel begins to tell them they will be restored eventually. And that's what happened. And that's what happened in yesterday's reading that he talked about that. Now, today in this reading, chapter 34, Having already done that, now Ezekiel begins to speak promise of redemption into a situation that was marked by defeat and enshrouded in dark pessimism. Sorry, that's still yesterday. Um, so, uh, yeah, so now he's going to talk. These are the, obviously, he's going to talk about the, the poor and awful leadership that Israel had that led them to this place of feeling God's wrath. So again, he addresses him, son of man, as he does several places in um, 
actually quite frequently, I shouldn't say just several, frequently in uh, the book of Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, okay? Prophesy. Tell them this. Political and religious leaders who have exploited and fleeced the sheep, that is God's people, instead of taking care for them, care of them as a shepherd should, as a leader should. Feeding yourselves, he talks about, yeah. You've been feeding yourselves. No, they've been hoarding wealth is what they're doing at the expense of the people. Gee, I wonder what that's like. Hmm. <clears throat> so it says, should not shepherds feed the sheep? This is what they're supposed to do. Instead, you eat the fat, clothe yourselves with wool. Right? Here's all these things that they do. These are common practices of a poor shepherd. But then in verse 4, he talks about what a diligent shepherd would do. You should have strengthened the weak sheep. You should have healed the sick sheep. You, the, the injured should have been bound up, like taking care of their wounds, bind up those wounds. You should have gone hunting and bring back the stray sheep. You should have sought after the lost sheep. But instead, you didn't do any of that. You ruled them with force and harshness. That's not how a shepherd is supposed to treat the flock, right? So, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. There was no shepherd, not like they were supposed to. They scattered, right? And they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered, God says. They wandered over all the mountains and every high hill. They were scattered over all the face of the earth. As a result of the false shepherd's awful rule, the flock was exiled into foreign lands, right? And no one was seeking, searching for them or seeking for them. So, therefore, because of all that's just been said, you shepherds who did this awfulness to your people, hear the word of the Lord as I live Surely because of all that's happened, they become a prey, they become food for wild beasts because there was no shepherd. My shepherds didn't do their job, but only took care of themselves, right? Therefore, this is what God has to say to you. God, I am against the shepherds. I will require my sheep at their hand. Because God chose the offspring of Abraham to serve his plan of salvation, they are called the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand, right? We use that in our Matins liturgy every every time we do it. That's from Psalm 95. Okay. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths. Sheep who hear the voice of the good shepherd and follow him are safe. For no one is able to snatch them out of his hand. That's John 10. Okay, so... Shepherds are on God's bad side now. The false shepherds, the good shepherd will fix things. But for now, the false shepherds, they're, they're in trouble. So God says, you didn't do your job. My sheep got scattered. I'll take care of it. I'm going to do it myself. This is, this, this is a tool in Hebrew. Greek does it too. I, I myself, me. It's like really emphatic. I'm going to do it myself. Okay. I will search for my sheep and will seek them out. This is what the shepherds should have done anyway when any of the sheep got lost. None of them did that. They were too self-centered. So basically, they've been fired. And so God, who owns the flock, is going to do what his shepherds were supposed to do. He's going to put the flock back together, gather them together, find the ones who are lost and scattered as a shepherd does this, I will seek out my sheep. I'll rescue them. You know, some of them were, you know, in dangerous spots. Some of them were about to be devoured by wild animals or whatever. They become prey. Nope, I'm going to rescue them. I'll rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. Mm -hmm. Typically sounds like a wicked day, a day of a day that God has not smiled on, right? You know, that's that's when 
not so godly things happen to the people and he's gonna he's gonna fix it i will bring them out i will bring them out from the peoples right they've been scattered among the other nations in their exile initially it was babylon but they scattered them all around right they wanted to dilute their people and their culture this was the babylonians plan was to just absorb anyone they conquered into their culture and basically dilute it and breed it out until that culture was no more and they had just been absorbed into the babylonian culture the hebrew culture did not do that they 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 survived that attempt to erase them so because god himself brought them back out from ex exile brought them into their own land back to the promised land and i will feed them on the mountains of israel by the ravines and all the inhabited places of the country okay um yeah this is this is their inheritance he's describing the land that he had already promised to give to abraham that they lost abraham's descendants lost because of their their disobedience their worship of other gods they're turning their back on the god who redeemed them saved them from oppression in egypt and he's still going to bring them back he's still going to fulfill his promise I'll feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel should be their grazing land. Interesting now how he's talking about the promised land as Israel. Israel was a people. Now he's talking about it as a place. Um, that, is, that is the fulfillment of the promise. There they'll lie down. Good grazing land, rich pasture. Right? It'll be a good place for sheep to feed, to rest, to settle. I myself, there it is again, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I'll do it myself. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. Make them, sheep lie down when they're safe, right? When they're safe, when they're settled, when they have everything they need. When they have, let's say, shalom, right? They, they don't, they're not in danger of any kind. They don't have to move to find food or water, shelter, they have everything they need. They can lie down. I'll seek the lost. I'll bring back the straight. I'll buy. He's going to do all those things that that the other shepherds, the other leaders of the people that had been appointed, that they failed to do. Those and the fat and the strong, those ones who did that by oppressing all the others, they will be destroyed. I will feed them in justice. Yeah. So, and it's interesting that, you know, when we call Jesus the good shepherd, we can see this all played out in this prophet that was centuries before Jesus was born. We, we, he's talking about Christ. That's how God is ultimately going to make this come true. So, so I always find it interesting to look for Christ references in Old Testament Old Testament verses that you, for those who heard this from Ezekiel, they would not have seen that coming, right? We have the gift of having the whole book that we can read, knowing how it turns out. Okay, let's move to 1 John. We're in chapter 2. We're going to read verses 12 to 17. I'm writing to you, little children, says St. John, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Okay, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So, you notice that today's reading, following yesterday's, um, today's reading 
is written in something of a poetic form, right? Um, and it's, um, there's a pattern to it. Children, fathers, young men. Children, fathers, young men, right? Um, now, why would he do that? First of all, all of them he sees as children because of their spiritual immaturity. Um, the state of all believers who enter the kingdom of God actually are, in God's eyes, little children. Um, your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. That's his being Christ's, right? It is, here's your, here's your gospel message. Your sins are forgiven because of Christ. And because the sins are forgiven... We know we are no longer faced with God's wrath. We know that we will we will receive God's mercy instead of wrath, and we will have eternal life with him because of Jesus and for his name's sake. Right? So to enter the kingdom of God as children, we know that will happen because of this. Now, writing to you, fathers. These are the more mature, the teachers and leaders among the people of this church. Because you know him who is from the beginning. They have already been taught. They were the first among this, this congregation that John's writing to. They were the first to know Christ as the second person of the Trinity, as the Savior. Yahweh as the, the Holy, the Heavenly Father, the first person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete, the Helper, the third person of the Trinity. The fathers here are the first, to, they were taught first. Know him who is from the beginning. Well, that, this is Christ, okay? Christ's namesake is why they're forgiven. Him who is from the beginning, remember John 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeah, it's more directed at Christ here, okay? Um, yeah, that which was from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men. Okay, now why young men? The less mature, not as mature as the fathers, but they, but they still have overcome Satan through faith in Christ because... They have been given spiritual victory and strength in Christ, right? They're not as mature, but they're still on the right path, and they're still living the life of faith. Now, I write to you children because you know the Father. Well, obviously, that's the first person of the Trinity. So this first part is about Christ. Now we have the Father here. Um, yeah. All who are born of God are given to know God as their Father, Jesus as their Savior, and the Spirit as their Comforter. All right, to you fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. Look at that repetition, word for word. This is for emphasis. All right, to you young men, because you are strong, right? You're strong. You've overcome the evil one. You're strong in faith. The word of God abides in you. You've overcome the evil one. Repetition for emphasis. Okay? Now, so... Don't love the world or the things in the world, right? The world is not uh, focused on God. The world is focused on itself. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, right? As a Christian, our love should be toward the Father. For all that is in the world, right? The desires of the flesh, right? These are passions. This is covetousness and the pride of life. He's already talked about these three things, right? We've seen this before. Yeah. yeah. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, which, yeah, pride of possessions, which is idolatry, right? That's how we read that the last time. That doesn't come from the Father. The Father doesn't want us giving in to our desires and our, and our lusts and our passions right? Those things come from the world. The world wants us to give in to those things because the world will reap the benefit of that. But the world is passing away along with its desires. The world withers away just as its prince, the, the, the prince of lies, 
withers away. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. We will have everlasting life and enjoy our eternity with God when we do his will. Now, that sounds like we earn it. We don't earn it. But God can't reward obedience, disobedience, right? Whoever does the will of God abides forever. Let me see if the some of these scholars might have a better way of putting this. Yeah. Yeah. To say abides forever means lives forever with God in spirit now and on the last day by the resurrection of the body. Doing God's will brings us close to God now. And we will also be then recognized as his faithful when judgment day comes. All right. Let's stop there and conclude our liturgy. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. Now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty savior, born of the house of his servant, David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight, all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you once taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day by the same Spirit to have a right understanding in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in communion with the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. And that concludes our matins for this Wednesday. Thank you for spending this time in the word with me. Thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Uh, yeah, I think we can be on a regular schedule this week, right? Should I knock on wood? <laughs> um, now we're on track for getting, um, keeping on our new schedule with, uh, Vespers Monday and Tuesday, Matins Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Suffrage is on Saturday. So I hope to be on that schedule for a while. So uh, if you have any questions about that, please reach out to me. Happy to discuss that. So again, thanks for being here. Wish you a blessed rest of your day. And until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.